Hello and welcome to the Vicar's Watch Dibley. The podcast where three priests link our stories with those of a Reverend Geraldine Granger and other TV vicars. I'm Kate. I'm Jenny. And I'm Ruthie. This episode we are talking about animals and the importance that they have to us as human beings. We also talk a bit about resilience as clergy and taking the hits of life and how we get through that. Just to inform you, in this episode, we mentioned very briefly death of children and death of pets. If you want to avoid these parts of the podcast, the time signatures will be in the description. doing i'm doing okay yeah how are you doing i'm good i've had, well i've had a really roller coaster kind of a week where i've had some big highs and some big lows so um i went and saw bill bailey oh, that was excellent i uh, enjoyed that very much but then also this week the the church i go to and my husband's vicar of um got broken into oh. and um they trashed a load of stuff and um yeah had police over and so you know it's been ups and downs <laughs> how about you Whoa. jenny well i thought i had some ups and downs in terms of pace like i had one day that was just absolutely back to back loads and stuff loads and stuff another day which is a bit more chilled but your ups and downs sound yeah very much higher than lows but yeah good mixture of pace this week mm. the highlight for me was um many groups of year one coming into church to learn about church features so we're looking at the pews and the stained glass windows and answering their questions like why did jesus die and i was like okay okay jenny this is your moment this is your moment <laughs> it's been a good week though you prepared for this moment yeah exactly <laughs> really. oh. sorry to hear about what's going on really with you. that sounds yeah really 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 tough yeah it's a bit pants but it's it's rallied people in a funny way. You know, mm. you find that sometimes, don't you, with, with when bad things happen, actually it brings a community together. Um, but there we go. Mm. Yes. Talking about highs and lows, which is a strange transition, but, you know, let's keep it smooth. I've got a couple of confessions for the confessional, um, but I don't think they're too bad ones, nah, they're actually. Right. So the first one, um, in our episode where we reviewed elections, I mentioned that I thought the monster raving loony party was no longer around, but actually they are. Ah, who default? They are. They're you see up, them occasionally. fighting, all good. They appear. And then the second one, which to be honest is much more exciting. <gasps> yeah. um, it was a Eurovision. It's kind of a isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. It was Eurovision. Um, we watched the results all together. Um, my predictions weren't exactly accurate. No. Firstly, um, the UK got points. <laughs> like I, I said, we'd get points because it's a good song, but we we came second. We came People second. gave us oh my goodness, deux points. We got points from the juries, but I think quite rightly so. Ukraine won the public oh, vote, yeah, um, which was just, a, I think, the best outcome. It was wonderful. Possible, I saw really. a tweet about it that in the maximum number of points that you could possibly get mm. from a public vote, they only got about twenty less than that. It was insane wow. how many people voted for them, yeah. which was so so great and yeah. so lovely. Incredibly and, amazing. Mm. Yeah, and my personal hope is that actually. The Ukraine is in the middle of a war and uh, I think hosting Eurovision is pretty low down on their list. So my hope is that the UK, as second, would say, uh, let us help you guys. We'll host this one on your behalf. You can oh. have all the presenters and that kind of thing. And then we'll get a Eurovision in the UK and take the financial hit for the Ukraine. Oh. And um, that would be my dream, I think. I love that. Well, I mean, I would hope that the war is over by then, but in yeah. terms of economic recovery, yeah. they may not be... It, it, I think it, it would be quite um, a hit on their economy to have to host Eurovision mm. yeah. because it's a very expensive thing to host. But we will see. Yeah. We will see. And if it does come to the UK, um, I think we should put some bids in to see if we can actually go see oh at least a semi-final. That would be so great. 
That would be so great. So we'll go in our dog colours. It'll be great. And take <laughs> and take horses. <laughs> <laughs> take, take horses. Yeah. It That'll was great. Oh, yeah, goodness. it was terrific to watch it together as well, especially joining for the results. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Caitlin, especially seeing your surprise, you're like, it was yeah. amazing. <laughs> we joined you a bit later, didn't we? we so it was, yeah, absolutely yeah. excellent. Yes, I, I had such an experience. Yeah. Such an experience. It was, it was lovely. I love Eurovision, and I was in a very excited mood the next day. But yeah, well, it was. I'm sure that all of our listeners will absolve us. Uh, I'm sorry, absolve us of our uh, confessionals for last week. But let us move on then. Let us press on to our episode for this week. We are looking at episode nine of The Vicar of Dibley. We're returning to our homeland, uh, where we are looking at the episode called Animals, uh, which is very exciting. So let's chat animals just quickly. I wonder, uh, Ruthie, could you tell us uh, what animals live in your vicarage, please? Uh, other than my husband. Way. Hey, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> yes, this is a vicarage with an animal. The the great to give her her full title, uh, Lady Vice Admiral Margaret McGibbons, uh, is our dog Maggie, uh, who is a lurcher and she's amazing. And we got her. Um, I think it's nearly five years that we've had Maggie wow. now. Um, and. There's this strange correlation, isn't there, between vicarages and dogs. And they either have, it seems to be a trend, especially for our friends, either have lurcher or greyhound types, mm. which is what I've got, or, like you, Jenny, who who resides in your vicarage. Well, Curly Brown Blue, otherwise known as Reverend Henry. And I say that because he really is a partner in ministry. <laughs> Like when people yes. come over, like obviously if people are nervous of dogs and he sits on the other side of the house. And to be fair, he does occasionally jump up. In fact, he does jump up. So I need to train him better. But most people are like, oh, you've got a dog. And there have been even some times where people will more comfortably talk to him than they will to me. Or if yes. they're sad, he will go and he, he, I know it sounds strange, but like he knows. Like he'll go and sit next to them or curl up on their feet or occasionally jump up on their lap. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, just push him off. And they're like, no, no, it's fine. And then they'll get yeah. chatting to him. And yeah, so Henry is a, he's a poodle cross. He's technically called a, a boar doodle because he's crossed the border collie, but I think that sounds too silly, but just say poodle cross. Um, but yeah, <laughs> he is, he is the second minister in this home for sure. But and you, I've all, yeah, you may sorry. Have also I, heard. I nearly, I nearly forgot my little darling bird. So I've got a little budgie as well called Will, who is about, uh, 12 years, 13 years old now. Uh, he's the budgie that keeps on going and he wakes me up with the singing every morning, sometimes too early. Um, and yeah, again, he often contributes to meetings and Zoom things, that sort of thing. You may he remember us talking survivor. about Wolf. Yeah, and yeah, uh, the, that's the true. fact that he's uh, had three roommates who've mysteriously died. Uh, <laughs> so Wolf, the serial killer budgie. I know, <laughs> bless him. I know, he's so, yeah, outlived them all. Jim, yeah. Jacob, and so, Han, but yeah. So, Kate, when are you getting a dog? Yeah! Um, there are plans. <gasps> um, really? I, I've kind of started actively looking, being looking on the Dogs Trust uh, website wow. listings. Uh, there's two Dogs Trust locations, kind of equidistant from where I am, and equidistant is such a good word. Yeah. Anyway, there's two Dogs Trust locations. Uh, I am looking, though, for a very kind of specific character or personality for a dog i need a dog because i've got joint problems i need a dog that's not going to be pulling on my joints and causing me damage Mm. so i need quite a gentle dog um that's quite happy to snuggle um so we'll see i'm probably just going to need to contact dogs trust and say look this is the type of dog i'm looking for although someone did suggest to me that maybe i should look to get a guide dog that didn't pass the exams oh interesting um, but I don't think my local area. I look. I looked on the website for Guide Dogs UK, and I don't think my local area has that type. They're, they're only looking to rehome dogs with specific, with complex medical needs at the moment. Oh. Okay. Mm. I I there is this weird thing about dogs and vicarages, and I know quite a lot of clergy people who have dogs, but I, do you know what, Kate? I can see you a, a bit as a cat lady as well. Thank I think you. if you were a pet, 
you would be a cat, Kate. <laughs> oh yes, I am a cat person, and I am a cat. I used to pretend and want to be a cat oh. when I was a child. Um, however, um, one a dog is a better ministry tool because at, it, at least around here, everyone has dogs. Everyone walks their dogs. Yeah, dogs are how you meet people. Yeah. Um, second. I really like my potted plants. I'm a plant mum, and um, cats notoriously eat your potted plants and knock things off shelves. And as much as I like cats, I like to be in charge because I am a cat myself, and <laughs> I will not be subservient to an animal in my house. I mean, dogs can do that too. I'll just throw that. My my dogs are rescue yeah. as well, and. Um, yeah, she uh, she caused incredible amounts of damage when we first got her. Um, there was mm. yeah the, the the incident where she caused four hundred pounds worth of damage in half an hour. Was um, that with the goodness. technology items? That's oh, when she our uh, Nintendo Switch. I remember that. that. Yeah, not good. Thank goodness for insurance. Mm. But anyway, we'll probably be posting lots of pictures of uh, Wilf and of Henry and Maggie and. We'll invent a pet for Kate. Uh, the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could draw one. I can take pictures of the pets that surround me. Um, I can take a picture of a ginger cat that lives on the path <laughs> on the walk there we from go. the vicarage to the church Ideal. and is a great friend. I'll tell you yeah. what, I've got some great. spiders as well, to be honest, that have adopted into my vicarage. Because oh, what I do yeah. find interesting is that Geraldine doesn't have a dog. Uh, although I think yeah. if she were to have a pet, I wonder if a dog would be hers. Well, later on, she does talk in the episode she does talk about why she doesn't have pets yeah oh i missed that bit about fi- finding little surprises and oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. let's talk about this episode so again we have the book that has the script hooray <laughs> and it has a, a very nice picture at the beginning of it of a budgie on top of a hymn book singing which is mm. great so let's crack on with this episode called animals and scene one we're in geraldine's kitchen and it's one of Jenny's favourite moments from the entire Vicar of Ghibli series. What are they talking about, Jenny? Well, I have spoken about this before. It's a, the classic moment of Alice declaring she can't believe that I can't believe it's not butter. Is not indeed butter. And she believes that there might be more butter than around than we all do think. And it's just... <laughs> Do you know what? I think I, mm. I saw a documentary. I went to see my dad and we watched a documentary on the filming of the Vicar of Ghibli, which was really interesting. So I believe at the time of filming, Dawn French said to Emma Chambers, you're going to be huge. When you film this, you are going to be huge. Like, this is absolutely comedy gold. Yeah. Mm. And she was like, oh, I don't know. But actually, when I think this is, I mean, tell me, listeners, what you think. But I think this is one of the classic moments of the Vicar of Dibley that really stands out in people's mind, Mm. this kind of monologue. And I think it took Emma yeah. Chambers, so who plays Alice, like a long time to learn. I think she was on a train or something. Yeah. And the whole train ride, it took her to get uh, <laughs> the words in the right place. But it so paid mm. off, and I absolutely just think it's hilarious. It is. It is a brilliant scene, and it is. I think one of the most classic Booker Dibley scenes mm. with um, with her talking about butter. Yeah, so it is absolutely lol about the butter. But do you know what as well? I think this scene for me kind of captures how often it can feel to talk with parishioners sometimes. Like, I love my parishioners <laughs> so, 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 so much. And I do this myself. But just occasionally you get an insight into how their minds work and you're thinking, I think I'm there. I think I'm there. I think, I'm... no, no, you've lost me. No, but God knows what you're talking about. And that's what matters. So, yeah. Yes. And then... Um... In this scene, towards the end of this this first little bit, we have a moment that could cause great controversy, oh, uh, depending on which oh, part of the yeah. country that we're in. So during this entire time that Alice is talking about butter, um, mm. uh, Geraldine is busy making scones and placing upon mm. them jam and clotted cream. Mm. And uh, mm. if you're international... Uh, listener, you may not have heard about this, but there's a very um, how to describe it? The great, great scone and debate, bitter rivalry between mm. two counties in uh, in England, Devon and Cornwall, about the correct way when eating a scone, uh, to how it. to put yeah, how to dress <laughs> your scone <laughs> correctly before you munch so, and crunch it down. In Cornwall, the jam. Goes first on the scone, then the clotted cream. Amen. And then 
in Devon, you do the cream first and then the jam. And Jenny, mm. quite clearly, you're on Team Cornish for this. I am. Mm. Kate, what do you uh, what do you think? I mean, I would go Cornish. However, the more I think about it, it kind of moving on from thinking about, I can't believe, I can't believe it's not butter. If you are using the clotted cream in place of butter, because I actually normally will have um, dairy-free spread and uh, and jam on my dairy-free scones. Um, so I suppose if one were using cream instead of butter, then I could understand why you might put cream before jam. Yeah. But if you're going to do it, you know, cream on tops, because then you can do a really good glob of cream. Oh, yeah. Thanks. What about it- you, Evie? I, I kind of agree with Kate there that if you're using it as a butter substitute, then it makes a bit more sense. But so long as you're doing proper clotted cream and not just mm. like whipped cream, um, then it, it kind of slightly makes sense. But um, no, I'm I'm team jam and cream all the way. Mm. Um, and so is Geraldine, which is perfect yeah. because that is the Cornish way. And I believe Dawn French now lives in Cornwall. She does. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that makes sense that she does that. So they're having this whole um, silly conversation about butter and, uh, mm. uh, and then eating scones. And then the doorbell goes and... Uh, Cherry's talking about how her mouth isn't big enough to fit her whole scone in and there's a lady at the door who's clearly very Mm. upset and she says at the door, she's asking the vicar to come and do a funeral for her because her uh, little Carl has passed away and she was hoping that the vicar could come and do the funeral tomorrow and Carl is three years old and it was a shock and a surprise Mm. and we have a massive shift (laughs) in kind of mm. pace and, and and dynamic in the room that we've had a very silly thing happen and then Blumenek we're talking about the death of a, a three year old it seems. Yeah. Mm. And this is I feel like this sudden shift is really just it is it's real in life. Mm. Where you're doing one thing and maybe it's a really light hearted thing or even anything else. Like yesterday I was talking to the person who helps with my cleaning and just having a bit of a natter. Then I get a phone call um, and it's to book a funeral. And that sudden shift, which then, even if it's just a phone call, just completely changes your energy, Mm. your stress levels. Um, And it's even worse for Geraldine because she answered the door in such a lighthearted manner. She's been having been really silly with Alice She's she answers it and talks about um, how God gets a lot of things right and especially men's bottoms, mm. <laughs> um, which and, and yeah. just that shift yeah. from light-hearted silliness to suddenly, uh oh. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think we get taken along with her. Like I remember crying at this mm. episode for the first time I watched oh, it, probably the Jenny. second time I watched it because I forgot mm-hmm. that actually what happens happens. I mean, and it takes the, the rest of us along with it as well. Like you say, that, yeah, big sudden shift. Um, mm. Which then, as luckily, a... Geraldine has Alice to, you know, once this lady leaves and the service mm. is, you know, agreed mm. on, she's got someone to turn to and go, oh, my goodness. Like, yeah, you won't believe yeah. what I've done. Mm. Yeah. And all of us watching this as reverends watched this scene and went, well, that's a very odd way to <laughs> organise a funeral <laughs> because that's not... Mm. normally happens and it's also something that we've been reflecting on as we're going through each of these episodes is that death features quite a lot Mm. throughout all of all of this so we're confused by the way we're booking a funeral because normally you wouldn't just say oh i'll turn up tomorrow and just have the name and Mm. an age that's very very unusual um but yeah weird Uh, yeah normally you they'd go for a funeral director yeah um and you'd have a visit beforehand. Um, but then Geraldine actually shines a light on this and she says, you know, it's so strange that they want to do a funeral tomorrow. Yeah. And people deal with death in very strange ways. Um, but then we shift and actually very quickly we get the resolution to mm. that question Yeah. in the next scene where we're in that family's garden <laughs> um, and there's some playing with perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then it's evidently revealed, as Geraldine talks about the way that Carl died, that Carl was a pet, 
that was eaten by the cat. And not a three-year-old child is what you're expecting to go and suddenly see. And yeah, Mm. uh, they play that very well where the kid's holding a matchbox. Do we even Mm. know what kind of animal it is? I don't think we do. That's up to the debate. Another thing I noticed in this scene was, that's George. Yeah. 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 George from From the the Windows Windows episode. Yeah. 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 George. But bless him, he's in a sad time, a sad place this time. Oh, bless him. With the oily goose. Yeah. 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 The name of the father, the son (laughs) and the oily oily goose. goose. (laughs) But then actually there's something about, I was saying this before we were recording, how... The more we're watching this together and really intentionally, you know, delving into this world and making it really real for us, the more I feel like we know this village and we know these people. So we know that family. We know, oh, that's George. And and his dad quite fancies. No, no, it's not his dad, is it? I think it is. is Yeah, it's his dad. Yeah, his dad would... would, um, would like to spend more time with Geraldine. I believe the phrase is, I'd like to give her one, yes. <laughs> as his dad has said. I mean, I think we've previously talked about on this podcast, Jenny's budgie funeral that we uh, did in, in college. Have you ever done a, a funeral for a uh, a pet in any of your ministry? Well, I have to say my very first pet funeral was for my guinea pigs when I was about uh, oh, yeah, maybe... I nine or ten I think it was I was talking about this recently on another podcast actually that was one of the first funerals I ever did and I brought the other guinea pig out to watch the guinea the funeral of the the other the guinea pig that had died to which my mum was like oh no it's too sad to have all the guinea pigs around <laughs> um but yeah that was my very first funeral I suppose but oh. since then no I mean the budgies yeah I had a budgie for my most recent uh, sorry funeral for my re- most recent budgie's death just me and my fiance in the garden. Um, we said some nice words about him. But yeah, no, other than that, it's just been my own pet. Oh, yeah. I did a, a funeral for a goldfish. Uh, oh, did you? Yeah, for uh, a friend of mine, her daughter's goldfish died. And um, so we, we said some prayers and said thank you for the goldfish and, and buried the goldfish. But this was one of the occasions where... Uh, having a clergy pet isn't necessarily a good thing because we got around to the house and uh, my dog had come with <laughs> and uh, the the burial place for the goldfish got quite severely sniffed oh, by my dog Maggie. Oh, no. <laughs> Not <laughs> dug thought, though. I don't think she oh, dug. Gosh. I don't think she dug but you just think oh my goodness me Maggie do not oh, go that's and risky. dig up yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> the corpse of the the goldfish that we've just buried. So um, yeah, but it's one of those things that some people, uh, clergy people, would not be happy about doing at all, and uh, say it's irreverent and all that kind of thing. I think, but in my opinion, it was it was doing a kindness and a good thing for a child, Absolutely. and actually, you know, uh, giving honour uh, for the companionship of a pet is very very important so yeah. how you do it is uh is different yeah but. definitely i think yeah to say thank you for the life that they've uh they've had and to acknowledge the work of you know god creating them and the joy that they've brought is so important so yeah well up for a little animal funeral or a thanksgiving sir. so moving on from that lovely scene of a burial of a beloved pet um we end up in the vicarage and geraldine and alice are talking about what's been happening they're reflecting on what they've just been doing while doing this jerry is chopping up a fairy liquid bottle to make a dog collar or clerical collar whatever you want to call it i think this shows that the show is well researched because that is a a trope that is true Mm. for a lot of clergy that they would use the old fairy liquid washing up liquid bottles other bottles are available hashtag not an ad um (laughs) um to to make collars and uh have you guys ever been caught short and needed to create a dog collar of some description when you've not got a dog collar 
I absolutely have. I must confess to this one. But I've only used um, plain white card. So I didn't get very yeah, creative, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in a, pan- in a moment of panic, I was like, where are all my little white bits of plastic? Because ah. obviously you have to take them out when you're washing your clerical shirt or um, bib stock, which is like a short kind of crop top dog collar item that you can wear with any clothes. Hashtag this could be an ad. Genius. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I live in them. Um, and sponsor, sponsor us and give us oh, free clothing. Yes. Dear oh, yeah. Collard UK. Dear yeah. yeah. J&M. <laughs> J- yeah. Dear. <laughs> Crop supplies. Yeah. Bring us all of your bib stocks. Yeah. We will wear them all. Bamboo and silky. But anyway, yeah. I digress. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, white, white card for me. How about UK? Yeah, but then actually, I mean, I haven't because I'm very responsible and I have very, <laughs> I, I, I have um, a routine and, I, and if I don't have my collar in by the time I've left downstairs and as I'm leaving the house I have some by the front door as well but anyway I think I have one in my car too but actually no one uses a furry liquid bottle anymore because see through I've changed the bottle yeah yeah but I'm sure there's a value supermarket substitute I'm sure oh probably Mm -hmm. yeah you know well going back to butter you could probably use some (laughs) some butter dishes yeah not butter dishes but (laughs) You know, butter containers. The plastic pots that you put butter in. I do know some people who have attempted to make more sustainable collars because the, the piece of plastic, it is a piece of plastic, which interestingly is patterned to have a fabric pattern on the side that's supposed to face outward. Um, so collars used to be made out of fabric. Um, oh. um, starched, white, yeah. cotton or linen, I think. Um, and I know some people kind of have tried to make... Um, make collars out of layered cotton to kind of replace oh, the right. plastic mm. something i'd like to explore because i mean the collars do last quite a long time but when when they break you've got a piece of broken plastic they are quite handy for toddlers though who uh mm. who need something to chew and play with from experience <laughs> <laughs> mine always tries to take ours out and we're wearing collars mm. and puts it on himself. It's Aww, really sweet. <laughs> um, but, so while um, yeah. Geraldine's doing all of mm. that, uh, they're talking about animals, and the, uh, there's a lovely line that comes up, and and Geraldine mm. says about people loving animals more than they love each other, and Alice says animals are nicer than humans, and Geraldine says, "Yep, good point, Wonderland." And I've never <laughs> noticed that nickname <laughs> before for Alice, Aww. and. From now on, we should call her Wonderland. It's <laughs> lovely. And also Geraldine's observation that people generally love their animals more than they love each other. I think that's true, yeah. sadly. Um, but then Alice oh, Alice tells a story about the animal she loves, the pet she <laughs> loves. About carrots. Carrot, she has a rough budgie, time, yeah. Who is either a Time Lord, which is what I tr- choose to believe, um, along with Alice, or... Um, was surreptitiously replaced by Alice's mum every time it died. Yeah. This has very so, much Father Christmas and Easter Bunny overtones, doesn't it? You know, when mm, Geraldine yeah. has big, big girl chats with Alice. Yeah. About life. And yeah, yeah. And so it. it seems that Alice has had at least four carrots, mm. <laughs> if not five. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, a rather disturbing insight. But, I mean, this is Alice's episode in which she shines, and we'll come back to it, because actually there's something later on which says to me, reveals something very deep about Alice's character, even as she reveals these very naive things about herself in other parts. So the next scene is a parish council. A, a bit of an idea has been implanted in Geraldine's mind, and she brings the idea to a parish council, which has a few items of business just to bring attention to is there's a pumpkin show on the coming, yeah uh, and a, a great weeks. rivalry the great between rivalry uh... between jim and owen and yeah. as in any other business geraldine just says oh i'm planning on doing an animal service and that kind of leads us into what the main part of the episode is going to be looking at because we see david's reaction to that mm. Mm. yeah so it- Geraldine uh, says about doing the animal service mm. and David just says, oh, Vicar, it'd be uh, great to talk to you about something. Come over tomorrow uh, after lunch because Hugo can't cook. 
and um, Geraldine goes over to Horton Manor mm. and is chatting and having nice banter and there's a comment about the horse's stalactite and all this kind of thing. <laughs> and Geraldine makes this comment about the relationship that she expected between herself and David being a bit like bickering. Mm. Uh, she compares it to Richard and Judy, uh, but actually it's got a bit softer and a bit more Mr Kipling, which is a, a delicious cake company. Uh, if you want to sponsor us as well, that'd be great. Um, and um, talk about how their relationship seems to have developed and grown. But then David delivers the smackdown of this animal service idea that you have is crazy and you shouldn't do it yes which you know really disappoints me because uh, my initial comment about david was oh it seems like he's shown growth because instead of doing this smackdown in a parish council meeting in public instead mm. of bringing his concerns to her in public and embarrassing her etc he um is doing it in private, which actually is the right way to do things, to bring things, uh, concerns we have in private to our brothers and sisters and other siblings in Christ. However, he, I'm just so disappointed in him because he then, you know, the rest of this episode is just complete backstabbing. Yeah, he's, he's not happy about the service and it doesn't seem to be mm. about... Well, he does seem to have some theological issues about whether nits can be blessed and all this kind of thing. But mm. it does seem to be more about the reputation of the village, which is mm. David's big thing, mm. and uh, the, the potential chaos and mess that might uh, happen mm. in the church. And uh, we were thinking about this, about whether blessing of animals is... Is that an issue theologically or um, where is there evidence of this in the Bible? And there are there are different places. I mean, at the very mm. beginning, God creates creation mm. and blesses it and, and says, you know, go go forth and multiply. Mm. And, 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 you know, looks at all he has created and says it is good. It is very it is good. good. It's good. It's, it's good. good. It's very, very good. Um. Yeah. And we have yeah. other instances of creation themes, animal themes throughout scripture, indicating a very intimate relationship with Christ, used, with God, used mm. to describe how we are in relationship with God. Um, in Jonah, we even have animals taking part in collective repenting, um, which <laughs> indicates, you know, that the reverse in terms of being blessed can be true. Yeah. Um, and in Matthew chapter 10, was it? Yeah. Was it chapter 10? Was yeah, it was chapter 10. Um, yeah, it definitely was. Yes. Yeah, tell us about sparrows, Jenny. Tell us about sparrows. Oh, well, as you were saying, in Matthew um, chapter 10, uh, Jesus says that uh, the worth of, I think it's two sparrows are sold for a penny, um, mm. but your heavenly father knows about them, he cares about them, and how much more precious are you than they? So although it's mm. uh, that God has his eye on the sparrow, I suppose, always, and relates that back to his relationship with us. Um, so mm. animals have a special place, like, throughout Scripture. I mean, even mm. in the Old Testament, they're part of redeeming people. Uh, they're part of the law. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, people are so wedded to their animals, which is, yeah. again, what Geraldine is... When I say wedded, sorry, I mean people are so close to their animals. Yeah. Not <laughs> Owen. Step back, Owen. Step back, Owen. <laughs> um, people depend on their animals. They're an important part of the law. They're an important yeah. part of religious functions. Yeah. And then Geraldine's carrying that. She's reinterpreting. Mm. Okay, here's a statement. She is reinterpreting the scriptures for a new generation, which is mm. the job of every single community. Um, but unfortunately, David is just not on board. He thinks, like like we've said, he's going to make a it's going to make a mockery of their village. He's asked her not to publicise it. He's mm. getting a bit shirty. But as soon as she doesn't agree, uh, this is when, as you were saying, Caitlin, we mm. get disappointed with David because he does the classic thing: she leaves without drinking the port. We hasten to add. Such um, an outrageous. Such an outrageous. Um, but then he calls the bishop straight away, and I think mm. that got some of our heckles up, didn't it? That he just went straight to senior leaders to complain although everyone has their right to do that if they want to but but he could yeah, have warned not her great. that he was going to do it yeah um which is one of the big things is i know when you're in ministry one of the most frustrating things is when people are upset with you and they don't tell you mm. and they don't seek to actually work with you and seek compromise they're just seeking to undermine you and it's actually a very minority of the time 
actually, but those times overshadow everything else. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Mm. And the issue as well is that there's a structure that we have as uh, as the church and there are kind of different levels that you could go to so you have um, people called area deans or rural deans depending on whereabouts mm-hmm. you are who are kind of like the first step of someone you could talk to if you have a complaint or an issue and then you've got like archdeacons above that and then kind of above that is the bishops and well you could even go archbishop after that um mm-hmm. but it's like David goes straight for the big guns as opposed to going through these different mm. stages that he could he yeah. could possibly go through. And so he just yeah. calls the bishop because the bishop's his mate, isn't he? That's the thing, mm. yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. But I feel like he shoots himself in the foot, really, because the next scene that we come to is this quite... I, I, I've got really bad vibes from this. I know he's an actor, mm. but straight away I was like, oh, he gave me real shivers. Yeah. He was mm. trying to trick Alice, bless her, and then Geraldine into talking mm-hmm. about the pet service and being really like smarmy and mocking like, oh, a gerbil's going to mm-hmm. take Holy Communion. And I reckon that wouldn't have happened if I could be wrong. This is just my creative imagination now. But if David hadn't run the bishop's office and word mm-hmm. hadn't started to get round about the pet service, then maybe it wouldn't have blown up into this massive thing. Yeah. So maybe even shoots himself because he says to the vicar doesn't he He says to Geraldine don't tell anyone about it and then he's the one that seems to be making a big fuss do you think it comes from him well it's because it's not like Geraldine goes to a radio about it we know she has links with radio budget but we know you know we're not given evidence (laughs) that she's gone to talk to radio Radio budget Budget. um but there is no at this point there is no twitter there is no social media it's not like she's shared an event on facebook Mm. and it's gone viral yeah um it's very much kept within the village the only voice that is being loud about this service outside of a village that we are shown is David Horton. Yeah, Has yeah. he gone to his country club and he's been nattering with all his mates? Oh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> be, 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 our female be. vicar. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then they've gone to... like, And it's not the paper that this smarmy journalist who is hanging outside of a kid's school as they're breaking up, may I note... Um, Creepy. The paper that he represents is a national paper, yeah. a, tabloid, a tabloid. I initially thought, oh, it's for local paper, you know, Dibley News, whatever. But no, it's The Sun, which is a national tabloid paper which is not known for its rigorous journalistic integrity. <laughs> In our completely unbiased opinions. In our completely unbiased. It, however, it is very widely read. Yeah. Um, Makes, I'm very popular yeah. and the fact so, that it's a front page news item as we find out in a moment mm, is just mm. must have been a really slow news day <laughs> must have been or someone with money <coughs> David Horton um, who's <laughs> in there with whoever owns the paper um, is doing something oh mm. yeah. well Those anyway mates. it gives him a massive amount of ammo doesn't it to then confront yeah. Geraldine because he said the one thing I want you to do is to not make a big thing of it. We don't think that she did. Mm, we don't think, no. like you say, no public publicisation. That's not a word. She didn't publicise it loads. <laughs> um, and then the next thing we do, no, sorry, the next thing we see is David rushing into the vicarage and he is super unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. He's waving a paper. Yeah. It's all on the front page with a very unflattering mm. photo of Geraldine. Yeah. The woman. And uh, yes, they've they've written a special prayer for it as well for the uh, mm. the service, which uh, our Father who art in doggy heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy pedigree chum on earth as it is in Battery's dog's home. Yeah, and pedigree chum is a brand of um, dog food. Dog food mm. for those who don't know. Yeah, and I, I have to like say, it, this is this is the hard bit now because it's not now it's not just David who thinks this is a bad idea. I wonder if for Geraldine now it starts to feel like the whole of you know the country is going, mm. oh my goodness, what a stupid idea. Yeah, and they don't get it; they don't get her side at all. Um, yeah, so I reckon at this point she's feeling pretty low, which might bring us on to a bit of a conversation either now or some point in our podcast as well about um we were thinking perhaps about resilience of clergy and you know depression and mm. um what it feels like to be uh, alone in ministry or uh, indeed when everyone you just feel like everyone's against you 
Yeah. So this, for me, I think, would have been mm. a big, oh, it would have taken me much longer to build up the courage again to keep going. But she mm. obviously believes in this service because she's, again, she's not completely overcome when all this well, is going on. Can we, I think we'll get to that in a moment. Because um, I think as well as finding it in a the paper, there's also this very, David says some things to her, which I think really also up for stress. That not only is there this national attention of turning her into a laughing stock, but then David sits down to her and is so condescending yeah. to her. This is this is what it says in the script. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is that you don't realise anything. You're a good woman with a good heart, but you should be running a cake stall, not a church. And I'm afraid, dear lady, the time has come for the sake of this community for me to begin proceedings to have you replaced. Number one, F you, David Horton. Yeah. Just go it's... jog right on <laughs> over the hills and far away and never come back. Yeah. Number two, so he's threatening her. He's threatening her with losing her job. Yeah. Um, and actually, it's completely unfounded because the only way that you can be moved on, not you deciding that it's time to move on, but someone to force you out as an incumbent in a parish or even as a priest in charge, it requires either a clergy discipline measure, which is for much more serious things than having an animal service mm. and letting animals into your church building... Or something called pastoral reorganisation, which is dissolving the parish. And I don't think that's what David Horton is planning to do. Yeah. What he is suggesting is that he's going to influence the bishop um, and apply pressure on her. And she's already under pressure. And I think this really ignites her low that we then see. Yeah. And the way he talks to her is just, it reveals his sexism and misogyny, yeah. doesn't it? Definitely. You know, mm -hmm. saying that she'd be running a cake stall and, and mm -hmm. uh, calling her dear lady. And there's there's no respect for her in her office mm. and everything that she's gone through. Yeah, definitely. It reveals that all the progress that has been made so far with David... Because there has been progress. We've seen their relationship get better. We saw earlier in this episode Geraldine's optimism mm. and joy that their relationship had improved. But it shows that all the progress has happened in him beginning to like her as a person, but not respecting her as a minister. Yeah. And the problem is that he's a very loud voice, isn't he? And he doesn't mm. necessarily always represent the majority of people, although in the bishop... In, later on, the bishop suggests mm -hmm. that he does represent quite a large majority. But we also see lots of different sides in this episode mm -hmm. that actually some people perhaps think it's a good idea or, or, or finding it interesting. But you've mm -hmm. in there in that moment, sometimes these moments happen in ministry where you just get smacked by someone, mm -hmm. not necessarily literally, mm -hmm. um, although sometimes that does happen too. But you just an unexpected whack and it can be mm. hard to get through that and I know I've had those moments and mm. tried very hard not to cry um because it's just come out of the blue and I'm sure mm. you both have as well um but it's how how you deal with that afterwards um yeah. and mm. do you have a plan to deal with it when it happens as well mm. yeah and how do we get through those difficult times i think it's really helpful to remember that it is often a minority of loud voices voices mm. who are overwhelming and guiding the less concerned majority and they will kind of grab those people who are in the middle and co-opt them mm. um, they'll often use language like lots of people yeah are saying or I represent a majority of voices, but very little personalisation and actually saying, actually, it's these people. Um, yeah. And we need to remember that loud doesn't mean truthful. Mm -hmm. um, and that there are other people who are supporting us. And um, yeah. we see this brilliant example of when Geraldine says, everyone's la laughing at us, to Alice. And Alice responds, no. Some people are laughing at us. Yeah. If I stopped what I was doing just because people were laughing at me, 
I'd have stood still, stock still, all of my life. Yeah. Which is such an insight into Alice's character because she so mm. often is the butt of a joke. Yeah. Um, even earlier in this episode where she's talking about her budgie. Um, <laughs> Carrot. And actually, she's aware of this. That That's actually a really painful moment of she knows people are laughing at her. Oh, yeah, of course. But she keeps going. Mm. Um, and having that support her and she says you know i will be with you geraldine i'll be supporting you during you on mm. honestly maybe geraldine should just marry alice <laughs> 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 um oh, obviously yeah anyway um alice is such a fantastic companion and yeah supporter yeah and cheerleader is, and having those and part, part of the team as well her yeah. ministry is really significant here like it because you know yeah. sometimes there are a lot of blurred lines in the book of dibley between you know, sort of professional and friendship when it comes to talking to others. Um, but here, again, it's Alice's ministry, isn't it? She's, um, yeah, really shines in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And Geraldine is very fortunate that it just so happened that Alice appeared at that point because it would have been really easy for her to just spiral mm. after that meeting with David. But suddenly Alice appears and cheers her on, which is wonderful. Yes. And there are other people in the village who are potential mm. cheerleaders that are quieter as we discover in the next scene we're in the parish hall and we're hearing more about mm. the pumpkin competition and you've got Frank and Jim and Mrs Cropley and then Owen appears uh, talking about the animal service and whether they're going to go and they're, um, they're not anti it are they? They're just worried about missing their mm. TV schedules for, for the, yeah. <laughs> during the time of the service or they think they're going to be hung over. Yes. From all the like, celebrating, yeah. Yeah. What it, what it reveals is that, you know, when David said, oh, uh, you know, no one wants this, actually people, they're saying they're not going because of normal everyday things. Yeah. And and then we have this fantastic interaction between um, Letitia and Owen, where Letitia says, oh, have you heard a rumour that Mr Horton's trying to get the vicar of the sack? And Owen says, oh, that can't be true. That can't be right. Mm. And again, just showing that David doesn't have the support of the other community leaders, yeah. which is what the parish council is. Yeah. Um, even though he's claiming that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so in this, what has been quite a dark and depressing scene, mm -hmm. we've had Alice cheering on, and then we see the joys of the pumpkin competition, and uh, <laughs> uh, the fact that Jim has grown. Uh, a big bugger <laughs> as <laughs> of a pumpkin yeah, that, the size of a wheelbarrow, yeah, that requires a wheelbarrow. Uh, so that is that is excellent. And then we go back to Geraldine and her living room, and Alice is sporting a particularly brilliant knitted vest. And the phone mm -hmm. goes. Alice answers it. Has uh, a weird conversation about liking the person's dress and uh, all these other things. Mm. And it turns out it's the bishop on the phone. <laughs> mm. And it's an interesting phone call that the bishop has with Geraldine. Not the best no. bishop interaction. I would argue... So the bishop has clearly been influenced by David Horton, his mate, um, and basically warns... Jerry, that if things go wrong, she's out. Um, well, I think it's just that she would have to take the consequences. Yeah, there's consequences to that. Whether yeah, yeah, because we... she's gone. You'd hope there'd be stages first. I yeah, that, that's yeah. what David Horton is pushing for. Yeah. But yeah. Either way, bishops are responsible for the pastoral care of their clergy. Um. So. If you think about, again, the structures of England, the priests are responsible for the pastoral care, so that's the support and care of our parishioners, of the people who live in our communities. And then, but we also have people who are responsible for our care to make sure that we're okay. And one of those people is a bishop. Um, and a bishop, d having that sort of interaction where, let's, let's remind ourselves again, this is about an animal service. I mean, maybe it was more radical in the early 90s. Yeah. But, or, or maybe in her appointment, there were some conditions about the community having to be on her side um, as one of the first female vicars being appointed. Is that but, something that happened? No, I don't know. Oh, right, but, okay. you know, maybe in trying to work out the logic of why the bishop thinks it's okay to approach it this way, 
Um, I guess it was quite innovative for the time that this was Mm. a a new, uh, quite a new thing to be doing. Um, I mean, I've been to animal services before. I don't know Mm. if if you two have. Maybe we need to do some research. So the bishop does a bad job of the phone call, basically. Doesn't seem to have um, Geraldine's pastoral, pastoral care at heart, which he should do as bishop. Mm. And then we have this amazing scene that the the three of us all love and are heartbroken mm. by at the same time, where Jerry's in her pyjamas, carrying around a crunchy, and has this <laughs> dark night of the soul moment the, the day before the service, mm. and prays these really honest prayers uh, about how much she's struggling and uh, worried about what's what's mm. about to happen. Mm. Yeah, we don't often see, I mean, although prayer uh, is a huge part of, you know, obviously the life of a, a vicar, a church leader, the life of a Christian, really, mm. we don't often see many prayerful moments, especially solo prayerful moments for Geraldine. So it's nice mm. to have this insight where she's literally just chatting away to Jesus and mm. she she knows he's got her back, but mm. yeah. It's done incredibly well. Yeah. Um, it's actually really real, at least for me. I do walk around my house just chatting yeah. through things with God, mm-hmm. particularly in those dark nights of the soul moments when everything feels dark. I think in terms of a staging of a scene that it is such low light, again, some fantastic choices were made to just show us mm. how knocked down Geraldine is feeling. She's had hit after hit of the paper of David Horton and then of the bishop. And she is in crisis, but she's talking to Jesus. I like that they've got her talking to a picture of him so that yeah. visually kind of we know who she's talking to. Um, and it's a casual prayer. But, you know, she is, it is kind of combined with her coping mechanism, which is to eat. You know, when <laughs> yeah. she talks about the last time she mm. ate hundreds of crunchies and drank some treacle. <laughs> and woke up woke up in shame yeah in a funny position on the couch yeah. yeah um which i mean her budget for crunchy bars must be astounding Insane. i have no idea how 300 odd crunchy bars cost back in the 90s <laughs> but that can't be cheap yeah. yeah so she she has this prayer moment and she just finishes mm-hmm. by saying that we help me out with this god i like it here and mm. I think we've all prayed those kind of prayers of, you know, yeah. this is a good place. I like it here. I just need your help. Mm. And so uh, the scene goes black and uh, it turns out that Geraldine has relived her previous nightmare <laughs> as we see her wake up, her hair's everywhere. Mm. And uh, the first thing we see is a uh, tin of golden syrup. <laughs> she's She's moved on from treacle to golden syrup. And there are mm. hundreds of crunchy bars everywhere, all over the floor. Uh, all empty. All empty. All empty. <laughs> and it's another, along with the, I can't believe it's not butter, it's another classic mm. Rick and Dibley scene of her mm. waking up yeah. in chaos yeah. of crunchies. Mm. Um, mm. Running around. But today is the day, though, isn't today, it? This is the moment is the we've day. been waiting for. Yeah, and this... And the scene is really, really clever in this because it cuts between mm. Geraldine running around like an idiot, not being able to dress herself properly. She's got a mm. bra on the outside and, <laughs> and panicking with scenes of people driving to church mm. and uh, heading to church with their pets and packing them all in the car. And Kate, I believe you got a little bit emotional at this scene, didn't you? Um, I started crying. <laughs> and, and the particular trigger for me was when we cut to... Like, I was sort of holding it together, just feeling very emotional about, oh, isn't it beautiful how we're seeing Geraldine feeling like everything's going to go terribly, but then we're shown kind of the truth of the situation, which is that it's going to go fantastically. And it was when we saw the horse boxes on the motorway, which says to me, just like the commitment of people travelling to see him Ooh. but i started crying and it's the weirdest thing i sent a text to you both saying i'm crying at horse boxes on a motorway <laughs> um and i didn't get but, it i thought it's because you yeah. were driving and you were worried that the horses were traveling too fast. <laughs> no. i didn't realize it was you were watching it, the episode it, it's, so it's, i apologize for that it's the commitment to bring a horse that distance yeah like, you can sort of see with the people who are riding their horses to come and join the service but that people have boxed up you know <laughs> That people have um, pulled their horses 
into its travel um, trailer and they are driving a distance, you know, taking all the stress of moving an animal yeah. like that. And they're that committed to come to this service. Yeah. And potentially, because of the national coverage, people are coming from much further afield yeah. mm, as well. That's true, yeah. yeah. Pays um, off, doesn't it? They're pouring quite... in down the village mm, lanes. Yeah. They're outside the church. They're inside the church. It just seems at this point, like you say, it's Dibley huge. is overwhelmed with animals and the response has been mm. really good. Really, really, really good. Yeah. So Alice goes to the vicarage mm. to, to greet Geraldine and to take her over to church, which is what she must do every Sunday. And she's smiling so much and Geraldine's yeah. picking up on it. And like, this is a bit weird. And then they walk out the door and they see the, the crowds of people and their pets all heading to mm-hmm. church. And there's this moment where Geraldine's face just goes from shock to utter joy and she smiles and is like, praise the Lord. <laughs> the, yeah. oh, goodness me, this has, has turned up and... I know that I've had moments in ministry where y- you plan a service and it's mm. it's something a bit different and you've gone for it. And I did one um, and, it, we, yeah, we were doing something a little bit different. And when it got to the first song in, in church, um, there weren't many people in there and I was a bit disappointed. And by the time we finished the singing the first song, I turned around and the church building was full and it was just such no. a relief that... Weeks and weeks of planning had, um, yeah, had had worked and, and people were engaging with it. And, yeah, mm. that's always a good thing. That's so true. And it's worth saying that that doesn't always happen. No, like so no. often, I think, in yeah. clergy life. But that is why it does feel so wonderful. It is a miracle because mm. so often you will plan and prepare and maybe create a service that is a bit more, um, well, a little less traditional, a bit more... Um, what's the right word? Innovative. 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 Innovative, thank you. Um, and people just don't turn up. And mm. and that is really tough. I remember seeing on Twitter the other day a priest who had done a really creative Easter service, like trying to engage, get children and youth with Easter. And they were doing iced biscuits and nobody had turned up. Mm. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, commented on their post saying, oh, I'm yeah. really, you know, I'm sorry this has happened. Mm. Yeah, it's really rubbish when this happens, but well done, you're doing a great job. Yeah. And happy Easter to you. And I saw that and I was like, <laughs> Oh. It doesn't always happen, mm. does it, that, that people do come? But yeah, yeah. this is a yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful moment of celebration. I love that, mm. Ruthie, imagining you turning around at the end of that song mm-hmm. and yeah. just seeing the church full. What a beautiful, beautiful image. Mm. Yeah. So we have this image of everyone uh, laughing and smiling and taking their pets in. Mm. And in contrast, we go back to Horton Manor and... Boo! Boo. It's miserable and quiet yeah. and very formal. And, and honestly, such an insight into their daily life. Yeah. Like how just awful must it be them both sitting in silence on the sofa all the time yeah and they're oh. just there not going to the service out of protest mm. and uh yeah looking very grumpy and so we cut back to the church and uh mm. geraldine's greeting a a lovely uh, spaniel is it a spaniel yeah yeah i think it is spaniel and saying Something like that. oh haven't they got a cute little face and it's uh, a bit of a skinhead who has the dog and Geraldine asked the name and he says Satan. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Geraldine suggests... Brave of him to turn yeah. up. <laughs> I hope he enjoyed the sermon. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so so we meet Satan mm-hmm. the dog and then we go back to the Horton house and Hugo delivers an epic speech yeah. at his mm. father. He's rebelling. Mm. I love it. And he says... We, we need to actually read this out. So, um, staying at home doing sod two is a pretty poor idea in comparison to taking old bruno up to the church to thank god for the animals upon which the economic and social life of our village is based and thanks to whom the lonely and old people aren't lonely and don't feel old yeah which is just exactly the expression of how important animals are in human life for companionship but I think particularly in these smaller rural communities where, yeah, our livelihoods depends on our an- on the animals. Yeah. Ooh. Completely. Yeah. And that'll be the case for, for you guys in your setting, won't it? If, if, I know, Kate, mm. your vicarage, you look out on sheep every morning. Yeah. And just the importance <laughs> of... And, mm. and, you know, even where I am in the city, actually, you know, 
the number of dogs I bump into in the in the park and the way people talk about their pets and how important they are for for that companionship and that kind of thing is mm. is amazing and so go Hugo um yeah and yeah. can I just I'm gonna do a really controversial t- controversial tiny shout out to David because he says you do what you think's right yeah. and I thought actually that is that is good advice even though he's hardcore against it and the only reason he's gonna go is take photos to show what a fail mm. it was yeah. he says to Hugo well you do what you think is right and that's all the permission that Hugo needs to jump out of his sofa, grab Bruno the dog, grab Patricia the stuffed owl, bless her, <laughs> and off they go to church yeah. to join in with all the fun. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. It's amazing. He does call Hugo boy, though. Yeah. What is it, boy? Mm. Could be a friendly, could be just a term of endearment, but yeah, but still, I think, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good part. Of... Boy. Well, he's not, you know, he's not a bad dad. Like, they they have a complex relationship and a relationship that I think perhaps for us it's hard to understand because we are not them and we have very little in common with them. Um, but, you know, David does care for Hugo and there is something about... I think he wants Hugo to be more of his own person as much as he also wants to control Hugo. Yeah. Anyway, let's not. Maybe that's we'll do an analysis of characters in other episodes. Um, so what we see is then. So we've got that contrast um, between Hugo's speech, and then we have um, Geraldine in the churchyard praying a blessing, um, which is such a lovely prayer. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it tails off at the end, but um, I might repurpose that. Do you have it in front of you? Yeah, shall I read it? Uh, mm, let us yeah. pray. Dear Lord, who rode into Jerusalem on the back of a faithful donkey, bless all these wonderful creatures here today. Give them shiny coats and full udders and tasty milk. And may one of them unexpectedly win the Grand National next year at (laughs) 200 to 1 when we've all had a little flutter. Amen. 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 I love that. Shiny coats and full udders and tasty milk. It's great, isn't it? And then um, mm. we then start to see the animals in church. They've all been outside mm. and the horses have very reverentially bowed their heads for prayer and things like that. And it's absolutely chaos inside the church building. Mm. And you've got parrots flapping about and goats trying to eat Geraldine's mm. <laughs> clerical wear. And it's... <laughs> and the flowers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Cropley <laughs> staring down, someone eating their flowers. <laughs> and it's chaos, but it's beautiful. Uh, chaos altogether and of mm. course they sing the classic hymn at the beginning all things bright and all beautiful all things bright and beautiful mm. which i hate with a passion <gasps> do you do you guys like it well controversial actually i'm going to say controversially for clergy because a lot of clergy don't like all things bright and beautiful because it is at every wedding uh. every baptism but i love it that's my controversial opinion i love all things bright and beautiful and i take special joy in knowing that another much despised song by clergy, which is a little town of Bethlehem, um, can be fitted to the tune of all things bright and beautiful because chaos reigns. Ooh. Oh yeah, yeah. It, you're just both singing. Yeah, everyone's trying a little sing song in there. I head. have less of an issue with it when it's sang bright and beautiful as opposed to all mm. things bright and beautiful. You know. That's not particularly bright and beautiful and cheery. Um, and I love that we, we, we go back to Cecil as the uh, mm, choir master yeah, yeah. and he's, he's got his little mouse in his pocket that he gestures to all creatures <laughs> great and small. And it's it's lovely. It's really lovely. It's just such a joyful service. Yeah. And you can tell that everyone is having such a good time. And even Alice who has her allergies, oh, is allergic her. to every animal except budgies, apparently, and is, has a little has a little tissue, uh, but she's there and she's enjoying it and she's willing to be there to support everyone. Um, it's just, yeah, yeah it's, it's such a wonderful service. We, we did have a minor debate, which we won't go into, about what type of service we think this is, whether it's <laughs> communion or morning prayer or Book of Common Prayer or not. But the fact is that this is a wonderful moment and something yeah. which everyone there will remember yeah. for years to come they'll remember the time that the vicar blessed their pet rabbit the goat yeah 
donkey, the horse, all of that. Yeah, it's brilliant. And I I love that Mm -hmm. um, her line about uh, thanking everyone for coming and behaving and and not having accidents and Mm. and all that kind of thing. And uh, (laughs) thanks to your animals too for doing that. I thought, ha ha, nice. That's a very Vicar line, I think. Yeah, it is a very Vicar line, that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And Mm -hmm. uh, David at this point has come along to uh to mm. see what's going on with his armed with his camera uh, ready to take photos to the bishop to show what a disaster it's been mm. and up yours david it's been brilliant and a great success mm. <laughs> yeah it was cool yeah. because at the end as people are pouring out of the service there's the soft music playing everything's going well people are looking really mm. happy they're all like yay with their animals yeah and then we see someone who's kind of cast as like one of David, like one of their own, as in like another sort of potentially conservative, possibly Tory, you know, someone else Old who's like kind of Lord of the Manor type. Yeah. David well, Horton, but yeah. better because he, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could be. And he comes out of church mm. with his crew, and he says, "Isn't it wonderful?" Mm. And uh, and David responds with, mm, "It does make one think." And I, mm. again, this is this is good isn't it because it shows actually it's not just a certain type of person who's not willing to mm. uh change the times move forward or be open to how god might be working in different ways mm. um, it's just david. and it's a little insight into yeah maybe david will be willing to stretch his imagination or his mm. theological understanding of what god is doing and what god can do um through geraldine's leadership as well although having said that i don't know if you two picked up on this but it felt for me like the framing of just after david had said oh it does make one think rather and then the shop hands to look at geraldine and you got the soft music and the soft lighting and it's a focus on her face for me it felt like a very romantic framing like it's less about like it's less about him considering again less about him considering her as a vicar and him thinking about her as a good woman with good ideas. Oh. And I don't know, it reminded me it reminded me very much of that of the BBC Pride and Prejudice. Um, where they're at Pemberley and uh, Elizabeth is turning the pages. Oh uh, the piano Georgiana is playing yeah. and you have that very similar Ooh. camera use where you kind of look at their faces and you kind of got that, hmm, there's something here moment. Mm. Something has changed in our relationship. Um, I don't know. I just... I see where you're coming from. Yeah. I heartily disagree. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And also with me. But but yeah, yeah, they do kind of do the soft light. I didn't read it as romantic though, so it's interesting Mm. that you did. But um, I definitely saw that as a... Uh, more of a this is a woman I can't mess with as much as I thought mm. I could but maybe because well spoilers for later episodes that is a mm. theme that comes up later on um, yeah, and maybe I'm mm. being influenced by those later episodes yeah and yeah. Um, I don't know and it's not I need to clarify but it's not that I feel like it's a mutual romance oh heck no um, mm. but I don't know, maybe because I'm still angry at David from earlier on and the way he talked to Geraldine about how I respect you as a woman and you're a lovely girl, Ugh. but you shouldn't be a vicar. Um, you know, I don't respect your authority as a vicar. Um, you should be running the cake store. Again, I feel there's part of me that just is still has that in my mind. So when we've got that framing, it's like, oh, she is a lovely mm. girl, isn't she? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I, I um, still reckon, yeah, it's the, hopefully, I'm hoping mm. it's the broadening of his theological scope to include new things and new ways to worship mm. god new ways to connect with the community and he's thinking actually i can see the success in this after all and it's challenging the ways and the you know the tradition of how worshiping god has looked like for so long mm. um but dare i believe that actually a different way could could work but yeah it's interesting i think it's something which we will continue to visit, revisit as, as rufi said mm. in future episodes this is something which is explored more of a, the potential romance aspect. Um, I think David and Geraldine's friendship, rivalry, relationship, however you want to describe it, is the ongoing conflict mm. of a Vicar of Dibley. Um, 
And I feel like a lot of this episode was about that. The last thing that happens in this episode that I think is just really lovely is you see Geraldine like flap her arms in exhaustion because it mm. kind of carrying that energy and that weight for it through mm. a service is really, really difficult. And they, Alice and, and Jerry just put their arms around each other. And my hope mm. is that they go home to the vicarage have have a glass of wine in celebration and a nice lunch yeah. and then Jerry just flops on the sofa. Hopefully mm. all the crunchies have been magically cleaned up and it's just <laughs> another moment of that beautiful mm. friendship that they share together, yeah. isn't it? Of mm. just having each other's back and, and mm. being each other's cheerleader and loving each other. They love each other so much yeah. and it's wonderful. Yeah, and I think that's our big lesson, I think, as clergy, as practitioners, that what gets us through the difficult times is prayer and our relationship with, with God, but our relationship with the people we love as well. Yeah, yeah and trying to serve them in a way that really feels mm. honouring. Because if Geraldine had thought, actually, maybe it's, this is just me, then this would have fallen to bits. But she knew that this calling to do something a bit more and to be, be a bit more creative came from somewhere else. And mm. yeah, my goodness, did it pay off. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Vicar's Watch Dibley. Thank you to Toby for editing our ramblings. Any views expressed in this podcast are our own and don't necessarily represent those of the Church of England or any other organisations with which we are affiliated. And as always, bless you for listening. Why does a pigeon not sound good when they're on stage? I don't know. I don't know. Because... Acoustics. 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 I always find that joke so funny, I can't say it properly. <laughs>